As of today, I will be living here at Mother Base. Now my real trial begins. Zadornov was paying my room, board, and tuition, but he has since been captured. I told the man that with no more money from the KGB, I could no longer afford school. He bought my story, and when I said I would be willing to work, he took pity on me and let me stay. For some reason, Miller really pled my case. That was helpful, but the man is still a fool. His men are no better. They think their training makes them strong, but that kind of strength is nothing in the face of true power. And better yet, they wait on me hand and foot, believing I am just a schoolgirl. Looks like I won't be working too hard after all. Just today, while scouting out the living quarters, I saw a group of them in the corner of the deck making a fuss. Going over for a look, I saw they were feeding a kitten. A bunch of grown hard men, and they're the ones acting like schoolgirls. Look, isn't he cute? What is wrong with them? Disgusted, I just nodded and smiled. I must stay in character after all. I indulged their chit-chat for a few moments. Then one of them asked me to give the thing a name. They had just taken it from its mother. I named it Nuke. I improvised some nonsense about how our compassion for living things can help prevent wars. The men gave me a little fish. I held it out in my palm and the kitten happily ate it up. What a pathetic, feeble creature. It sickens me. Today, Chico invited me to go fishing with the soldiers. I suppose finding one's own food does have its merit, but I prefer not to be involved in such a degrading task. And their prattling on about fishing being fun is nonsense. I'm not here to find playmates. Nevertheless, distasteful as it was, I went along in order to maintain my cover. Chico thrust a fishing pole into my hands, and we went up onto the deck where several soldiers had gathered. They welcomed us warmly. With so few women aboard Mother Base, I'm treated like a princess. No one suspects I am neither a teenager nor a student. It was nice and sunny, with a gentle breeze and waves. As I cast my line and waited for a bite, the soldiers began to ask me all sorts of questions. As always, I answered according to our predefined scenario, feigning a smile. As I sat there feeding them lies, the fish began to bite, and the soldiers began to focus on their prey. Chico had his bait stolen by a fish, and got so angry that he stood up and nearly fell into the sea. Everybody laughed. It almost made me want to join in too. At some point, I got a bite myself. The instant after I felt that first gentle tug, the fish yanked the line with astonishing strength, and I let out a cry of surprise. I thought he was going to be huge. It was my first time fishing, and I was a bit flustered, so the soldier beside me helped by supporting the pole from behind. Reel it in, they shouted. I nodded, turning the handle as fast as I could. I wondered what kind of fish lived below the surface and thought back to the deep sea dives I had to do as part of training. Those were difficult days. But I remember finding the multicolored fish gliding through the water incredibly soothing. After a hard fight, I pulled it up. To my surprise, it wasn't even half a vara. Rather anticlimactic. But I wasn't doing it for fun, so I wasn't the least bit disappointed. Nuke was hovering nearby with an expectant look on his face, so I gave the fish to him. All in all, a thoroughly wasted day. Preparations are coming along nicely. No one suspects me of being the one to let Zadarnov out of his cell. Today, Amanda and I taught Cecile how to make gallo pinto. It is a simple home-cooked dish consisting of black frijoles mixed with arroz. It is well known throughout Central America, not just in Costa Rica. So it is no surprise that a Nica like Amanda would be good at making it. But I was raised in the States from a very young age and can hardly even remember my mother's gallo pinto. 
having to make chit-chat with that clueless bird lover and the so-called revolutionary was excruciating. And, clueless or not, I wanted to be especially careful around Cecile, the one who actually recorded that tape. Thankfully, Miller and his men seemed to believe I mistook the tape I found for one my friend made. In any case, one can never be too careful. Anyway, the three of us minced garlic and herbs, then cooked them in a pot with frijoles we'd soaked overnight. While waiting for them to cook, we sautéed onions and arroz in a frying pan. Cecile worked the frying pan according to Amanda's directions, but seemed a bit glum. She does have a knack for cooking, though. She is French, after all. We added water to the pan and watched the arroz begin to steam. While we waited, Amanda shared memories of her mother with us. They had been separated because of Simosa, but the taste of her mother's cooking was still fresh in her mind. When the frijoles were ready, we drained the water, stir-frying them with the rest of the vegetables. Quite a complicated process for home cooking. Nonetheless, it kept them occupied. The longer we sat and talked, the greater the chance of my arousing their suspicions. With women, it is not enough to just bat your eyelashes and giggle. It takes a lot of effort to divert attention. When the arroz was done cooking, we folded it into the frijoles and added salsa, stirring the mixture as it simmered. At this point, for some reason, the conversation turned to romance. Why does it have to be that way whenever women get together and chat? Cecile fancies herself to be well-versed in such matters and gave Amanda all sorts of advice. It was harmless enough, until, to my irritation, she began pestering me whether there was anybody I liked. Not right now, I said, trying to dodge the question. But she pressed on. It's Snake, isn't it? I gritted my teeth and played it coy. Maybe. Cecile nodded and giggled. He is pretty sexy, isn't he? What a ditz. It's all I can manage to just survive. The thought of romance has never once crossed my mind. I have no interest in that kind of man. Soon enough, a rich aroma began to fill the room. The gallo pinto was ready. New came over and rubbed up against our legs, looking for a handout. Unfortunately, it was not the kind of food a cat would like. We let a few of the soldiers have a bite, and then headed off to the mess hall. The home-cooked flavor we'd achieved was a big hit with the men of MSF. Not that we are trying to impress them or anything. Even I could manage a dish like that. Snake enjoyed it too. Let me make this absolutely clear. I have no interest in that man. Football, or soccer as it is known in the States, is extremely popular here. It has not caught on yet in the U.S., but as fans can get so rowdy that it is commonly believed El Salvador and Honduras went to war in 1969 over scuffles in a soccer match. In reality, tensions between the two countries were already high. The match was merely one of the sparks that set them off. But these people are so passionate about this sport that the story seems plausible. Predictably, many of the soldiers here are fans. They have apparently divided themselves into Costa Rican and Nicaraguan teams and started playing each other. To play, you need a ball and two goals. The R&D team built and set up simple goals on the deck. I had absolutely no interest, but Chico insisted that I come and watch. It was not a proper match by any means. The pitch was not even regulation size, but the players and spectators alike got pretty excited. They banged empty cans and shouted cheers through the handmade megaphones. It almost felt like carnival. Huey, the referee, blew a whistle to start the match. The soldiers' training has left them in excellent physical shape, but they lack the honed skills of professionals and their play was quite rough. Midway through, one of the men collided with another. They started shouting at one another, but Huey stepped in. I thought we had forsaken our countries, become one with the earth, he said, quoting Snake. We are not competing for national pride here, and we are not fighting for the good of any one country. This is not a war. Soccer is a peaceful sport, am I right? The soldiers nodded. They know the pain of war, 
and they share Snake's vision. Perhaps that is why all this resonates with them. Team Costa Rica was down a man, and somehow, I was picked to fill in. Costa Rica had the advantage up until that point. I suppose Huey wanted to keep it balanced. The soldiers agreed with Huey's call. Maybe the Costa Rican players felt an even matchup would be more fun, too. I could not be bothered to run at first. But chasing the ball out there in the hot sun, I was soon drenched in sweat. Before long, I found myself actively seeking out the ball, partially out of desperation. I picked up a loose ball deep on the opponent's side of the field. Even though he's Nicaraguan, Chico cheered me on, yelling, Go for it! Shoot! I launched the ball as hard as I could, only to have it blocked by the keeper. Disappointment only increased my determination. In the end, I didn't score a single goal, and Costa Rica gave up its lead. It was really close, though. We congratulated each other on a good match and sprawled out in the shade on the deck, exhausted. The ocean breeze felt so nice on my sun-soaked body. Nuke came over. It is one of his favorite spots, and stretched out next to me. And together, we watched fluffy white clouds drift lazily across the clear blue sky. It was lovely out today, so I decided to sun myself in a lounge chair up on the deck when strange love came up to me. Despite the heat, she was in her usual long sleeves and pants. I waved at her. She looked away and mumbled, Hello there. Fancy meeting you here. I asked if she needed anything, feeling her eyes creeping up and down my body like she was savoring it. Finally, she swallowed and said, You have such beautiful skin. Bewildered, I shook my head and said, No, not at all. I had heard rumors that she was a lesbian. But she couldn't be after me, could she? She continued to stare and said, No, it is beautiful, but you must not let yourself get so tanned. And then she took my hand in hers. What is wrong with a little son, I asked, trying to cut the conversation short. But she shook her head violently. No, you mustn't. A young lady should take better care of her skin. She was acting strangely now, as if aroused. She lectured me on the perils of tanning, how it ages skin, causing wrinkles and spots, and in the worst cases, even skin cancer. I knew already that tanning could cause spots, but I thought only pale-skinned Anglo-Saxons had to deal with that. Having a scientist tell me it causes aging, though, that spooked me a little. If I am to keep playing the teenager, I will have to start paying more attention to my skin. Sensing my anxiety, she took a small tube from her pocket. She said it was the sunscreen she always used. She told me to keep it. I didn't know what to say. I was more than happy to take it, but exactly what were her intentions? Was she merely being nice, or is she really into me? Either way, there was no reason to refuse, I suppose. I have undergone training. An out-of-shape woman does not pose any real threat to me. Having power means not being afraid. It is the same on a global scale. A country with nukes can dictate terms to a country without them. I thanked her and took the tube. Then she offered to put some on for me. She squirted some lotion onto her fingers and began rubbing it into my chest. It happened so suddenly, and I was so taken aback that I did not even think to protest. She caressed my stomach with her long, white fingers, then slid them upwards between my bikini-clad breasts. What? Wait! I sputtered as her moist eyes met mine. She was beautiful. Somehow, I found myself captivated by this woman more than ten years my elder. Hold still, she whispered in my ear. I nodded silently, unable to refuse. My body went limp, motionless, as if in a trance. Gently, carefully, 
She rubbed the lotion all over my entire body. I shouldn't have enjoyed it. And yet, I could not help myself. For a moment, I was spellbound. That woman is dangerous. I had better watch myself. Protecting one's health is an important part of any agent's job. But despite my best efforts, I have caught a cold. Now that I think about it, Mother Base's numbers are on the rise, with soldiers coming from all different places and backgrounds. It is no wonder, then, that sooner or later, someone would bring in a virus. That said, what I have got is just a common cold. The medical team said I'd need a few days rest, so I've been restricted to my room and put on bed rest. I thought I'd gotten used to not having anyone around to relate to, but at times like these, being alone is just miserable. All I could do is lay there and stroke Nuke's back, trying to take my mind off how bad I felt. Nuke just sat there, not making a sound. But I did have visitors, Amanda and Chico, Huey, Cecile, Miller, and a few of the soldiers I've become relatively close to. Amanda made me a soup with herbs she said were good for a cold. Miller told me to take it easy. I will sing you a lullaby, he said, then broke out a guitar and sang some incomprehensible song in Japanese. I did not need to understand the lyrics to know he is an awful singer. Then he said, you know what is good for a cold? Suppositories. Here, I'll show you. He began to take off his pants, so I threw my tissue box at him to make him go away. Then, Strange Love showed up, saying she had some miracle Indian cure. It has got eucalyptus extract, she said. It works best if you rub it into your chest. And then, she tried to take off my nightshirt. I whacked her with my pillow, and they got rid of her. Chico brought me a little flower in a cup. It had been growing in a little bit of earth that probably found its way on board stuck to something else. I found this on the deck. Here, you can have it. He tried to act nonchalant, but I am pretty sure he's got a crush on me. None of them understand. If they thought these little visits would cheer me up, they were wrong. Tonight, Snake himself came to my room. Like the rest, he believes I am just a schoolgirl and treats me as such. Why did you abandon your country, I asked him. Why create the MSF? Of course, I knew the answers already, but I wanted to hear it from him. As I had imagined, he was not exactly forthcoming. All he would say is that his country abandoned him, because all he could do was fight. And that is why he needed the MSF, because that is all he is any good for. Then he said, fighting is the only thing I understand, but that does not mean I have got a grudge against those who believe in peace. I am not one of them, and I do not believe in peace. Conflict is in man's nature. We fight our enemies in order to survive. Maybe we are not so different after all, he and I. But that is exactly why I'm going to have to kill him. Or else he will have to kill me. When I stop and think about this wretched existence, being killed by a man like that suddenly does not seem like such a bad thing. Every month, Mother Base throws a party for all the soldiers whose birthdays fall in that month. There is something strange about a military organization having parties. Really though, it is just an excuse to drink and make noise. It is not easy to get alcohol on a fortress in the middle of the ocean. Most days they are training from dawn till dusk. They do not have time for things like drinking. That is why Snake and Miller came up with the idea to give everyone a chance to let loose. Obviously, a bunch of boards like that are not going to bother with blowing out candles on a cake. Rather, they sit there in a cloud of cigarette smoke drink beer, eat meat, tell tasteless jokes, and swap crude insults about one another's hometowns. But it hardly ever breaks out into something serious. They talk up a storm, but they're just having fun. It is funny. You have got members of FSLN rubbing shoulders with the UCLA's, 
People who once would have considered the other mortal enemies. I wonder if that is what makes Big Boss so popular. In leaving their countries behind, they leave their hatred for other countries too. Miller seemed a little protective of me. Hope they're not being too crude, he said. But soon enough, he too was drunk. He yelled, come here and take a look at the real Kazuhira Miller. Then dropped his pants and mooned everybody. The other soldiers burst out laughing. I have never seen such a crude, ridiculous party before. And yet, all these people laughing and acting a fool. Is this what they call peace? For some reason, I began to think about all that has happened since I came here. Fishing with Chico, cooking with Amanda and Cecile, playing soccer, having visitors when I caught a cold. When I stop and think about it, my time here has been the most peaceful of my life. But that is about to end. I cannot imagine you will be willing to negotiate. It seems I am to fight the legendary Big Boss. I do not know if I'll be able to beat him. But if I have to choose between death and defying Cypher, I will gladly choose death. The thought of dying does not scare me. But if I disobey my orders, the fear and despair awaiting me will be far worse than anything I can imagine. It was Cypher who took me in as an orphan, gave me food and a place to live. His orders may have been unreasonable, but I will never repay my debt entirely. It seems I have no choice. I must fight this man. I must fight Snake. Do you know Miller? Snake's right-hand man? Apparently he has got at least one serious weakness. He is an insatiable womanizer. He does not bother me. Most likely because he considers teenagers off-limits. But he has hit on every single one of the few female soldiers here at Mother Base. They ought to be telling him where to stick it but end up falling for it so easily. I think some of it stemmed from the fact that he is actually not that bad looking. Anyway, today, that nasty habit got him in trouble. He and Snake got into one of their rare fights, and I was there to see it. They burst out of the showers completely naked, trading punches. I am no child. The sight of a naked man does not make me blush, but this was something else. Maybe this'll teach you, Snake yelled as he slammed his fists into Miller's chest. I heard later that apparently he had been two-timing someone, and that Sam someone had gone to Snake with her troubles. As I see it, it is her own fault for letting herself be deceived like that. If she is too dumb to see through Miller's lies, then she got what she deserved. But this was not the first time it had happened, or the second, and Snake read Miller the riot act. Miller argued back, and what began as a shouting match turned into a fist fight. You son of a bitch, Miller yelled as he swung. Not bad, said Snake, smiling, but not good enough. And then he was back on the offensive. They had already been at it pretty hard in the showers and their bodies were covered with bruises. Both of these men had been trained for war, their bodies deadly weapons. They were each bleeding from a dozen places. All this from a fist fight. Even so, it was far less gruesome than if they had given it their all. It was obvious that one of them would be dead were they fighting for real. Miller took another swing, yelling, Try this then! Snake parried, then responded in kind. But I could tell he was not aiming for anything vital. You are one tough bastard, boss, Miller muttered. A smile crept across his face as he caught his breath. And then they went right on fighting! Blood and sweat flew off their glistening bodies. He was combat without hatred or hostile intent. I had never seen violence like this before. And yet, it was more than just a friendly tussle. They were utilizing every technique they knew. It was not a sporting match. They were not playing by the rules. How could they keep this up? At last, the two men tired themselves out, and the bizarre scene came to an end. They looked at each other's battered bodies and then burst out laughing, embracing and congratulating each other on a good fight. You don't seem so idiotic. I still cannot fathom such behavior. But somehow, 
I got the sense that for all his womanizing, Miller really only trusted one person, and that was Snake. There was no way I could ever come between the two of them. And at that thought, I began to feel as if I had lost. All of Mother Base is preparing for a festival. Since Snake and his soldiers spend so much time fighting, they are setting aside one day a year for peace and relaxation. I do not know all the details, but apparently that is what Snake and Miller decided. These soldiers love the idea, of course. There is so little fun to be had here that everybody looks forward to events like these. That is all well and good, but somehow I got roped into getting on stage. Come on, we even both have peace in our names, said Miller. And Zadarnov, that old Ruski's name, has something to do with peace too, right? Hey, as long as we are having a day of peace, we ought to get an act together. The Three Peace Band. I thought he was joking. He then proceeded to share his idea without bothering to check with me. And now, I am slated to sing. Apparently, he had heard me on the deck one day, and since then he's wanted to form a band. Everybody's looking forward to it, so there is no way for me to back out now. I have never done anything like this. But it does feel kind of nice to know that people are looking forward to it. I mean, it cannot be any worse than Mueller's singing. But modifications to Zeke are already finalized. And I must complete my mission. Betray Sai for now. And I will face a fate far worse than death. Still, there is no need to put things in motion just yet. What difference would it make to just wait a little while longer? A whole day of peace. The mission can wait until after that. Can it not? I know I am only delaying the inevitable. When the day comes, one of us will have to die. Snake or me. But still, if I could just come up with some way to stall Cypher, at least until our day of peace, when did I start having thoughts like this? My cover is blown. They know nothing of Cypher or my true objective. But they know I am a spy. There is no more time left. I must act now. I must complete my mission. How did it come to this? All I wanted was three more days. Just three. Miller's already finished writing the song. It is called Love Deterrent. It is about a girl who cannot express her true feelings. I have been practicing. I am no pro, but I was pretty sure I would do a decent job. And now this. Cypher found out that Zeke was complete. He must have someone inside Mother Base besides me. Spinning his tightly wound web of control, leaving no room for individual will. Typical. When they found out Zeke was complete, I was ordered to execute the operation immediately. If I was going to enjoy just one day of peace, I had to ensure the plan could not move forward. I tried to sabotage Zeke. I thought by damaging the drive system, they would have no choice but to delay their plans. I waited until midnight, and then snuck into the hangar. There would be trouble if it looked like sabotage. I selected one of the drive system's load-bearing parts and carefully worked to warp its shape. The legs drive system requires a high degree of precision to operate. Even the smallest deviation would have done it. Then, Chico walked in. <laughs> Maybe it was one of those nights where he could not sleep. In any case, he saw me, panicked, and took off running. It would have been easy to kill him, but I could not. I know he likes me. It is not as if I would ever have an interest in a child like him. But I could not pull the trigger. Not at him. Not in the back. Will he tell them? Or is there a chance he will keep it a secret? Protect me? No. He knows now. Knows I am not who he thought I was. He ran without even questioning what I was doing. There is no chance he does not know. And soon, all I have built here will end. And if Cypher has another agent among them, if he finds out I tried to sabotage Zeke, 
This place will no longer be my heaven. Then it is settled. I make my move now. Chico walked in before my sabotage was complete, so Zeke should still be operational. It might not run at full speed or power, but I do not have time to fix that. Without Zeke, I do not have a chance in hell of winning. I must act fast before Chico sounds the alarm. I knew it would come to this. <laughs> I just did not think it would be so soon. <laughs> It is time, Zeke. Metal Gear Zeke, activate. 